Hello, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here. Um, my husband and I are combining talks and cycling. So we, we've got a, a good bit of both in. I wish today was a cycling day with this weather. We, we did have a couple of rain days. So uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure though to be here. And I will mention that Bartram Trees uh, is a partial sponsor of my travel, uh, hosting me. And uh, take a look at their stock, wonderful material. The Big Barn Conference was last week and that, that was quite fun. We've heard a good bit this morning about how to more effectively introduce trees into built environments, into hardscapes, into cities, into communities. And I started out in that world. I started out as a biologist, then did a brief stint as a landscape architect, thinking that would be my professional ambition. And then I took courses in environmental psychology, and it clicked. This is where I found the blend between people and nature, people and environment, people and ecology. And so what I'd like to do uh, today is just to share a little bit, a slice of some of the research that my colleagues and I have done over the years. Students, other scientists, um, and people in professional groups in local government. Because doing social science, it's absolutely necessary that I collaborate with people such as yourselves that are leaders in your community, your leaders in your organizations, and uh, that's what helps make social science happen. Uh, we've heard a little bit this morning about uh, iTree, iTree Eco, and there are a, a number of different iTree analysis tools. And I work part-time for the Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, with a research station, so I'm almost obligated to talk about iTree. And that tool enables us, by looking at the entire canopy, the tree canopy across the city, to understand a range of benefits and values. And what we do then, or we, meaning you in your communities, perhaps uh, uh, hiring or engaging volunteers to help collect data, you first understand the structure of the forest. You understand the tree distribution, species distribution, age, and, and, and various other components or um, descriptors of that, of that forest. From that then, you can begin to understand the function of the forest. Water quality, storm water management, air quality, quality, energy savings, as well as more tools and more benefits and functions that are coming online with, these, uh, with the iTree uh, suite. Some of these tools then, you turn the crank one more step and you learn about value. What are the dollar or pound benefits associated with some of those functions and the, and the structure? And finally, once you know all of this, or once a community understands all of this, you can make much better management decisions. And you can potentially engage other people who often, this is what I encounter as a social scientist. Why are trees good in the city? They're pretty. I love how trees look. They're so pretty. What these tools do is to help us to communicate that trees are s essential in our communities. Yes, amenity is great. Yes, aesthetics um, make quality of life or enable quality of life. But these tools and these values help us to express the essentialness and how profoundly important it is to have trees in our communities. So we learn about stormwater, reducing stormwater runoff, and there are speakers from around the world and probably in this country, these, your cities, who can speak at length about this. Likewise, air quality, the combination of particulates settling in the canopy on the surfaces of the leaves, leaves and bark, as well as metabolic processes that, that um, exchange gases and various polluting materials. But I want to, as a social scientist now, get personal because we have done in Seattle an eye tree analysis. And I find that we then talk about trees at such a high level that many people don't connect that to that. Some elected officials do. Some of the technicians in our communities do. But there are a lot of people who have political clout in our communities who don't necessarily connect at that rather abstract sort of level. 
So I'm, I'm, before I get to the main event of talking about trees and retail communities and, and uh, consumer habitat, um, there was mention about health. And we are finding in the United States that the evidence about trees and urban nature more generally, gardens, parks, open spaces, trails, connections to health are how we're engaging more and more people uh, who really don't know a lot about trees, but they're seeing the connection to green and they're starting to come on board. The World Health Organization has defined health in a very comprehensive way. It's not merely the absence of disease, but it's quality of life. And it's having um, the uh, uh, capacity for resilience. It's having the features in our environment that enable us to be at our best as well as being, not being ill. And here's one way of looking at that. So often, in some uh, instances, talking to medical people or ho public health people, uh, they often focus on epidemiology, and that is uh, individuals, age, gender, uh, hereditary factors, and then they may move into the next band of lifestyle factors. Do you smoke cigarettes? Uh, what are your eating habits? Uh, do you have a sedentary lifestyle or do you get up and move about in a routine way? So often health officials focus on these things, but we as part of this green community know that that outer band is very important. Creating quality environments and that's where trees, the urban forests, parks, gardens, open spaces, that's how they connect to these essential health elements or health consequences in our cities. So to share some of this information, and again, a um, little sidetrack here, but we have now over 40 years of research about this connection between nature and health and human wellness. And some of that research has been done here in the UK, some in the US, some in Australia, some in Japan, more and more of it coming along from China. Um, and what we see then is we by way of experience of green, there are opportunities for health promotion and disease prevention. And it's fairly direct. And it happens fairly quickly. So some of the classic studies that were done by Roger Ulrich, who is an environmental psychologist in the US, now working in Sweden, early on, mid-1980s, he did studies, laboratory studies about, about stress response. And in a matter of about five seven, eight minutes after people are stressed and have a view of green, this is not walking, this is simply seeing trees in green, stress response is reduced and much more effectively than if you're looking at a built environment, if you're looking at all buildings or constructed materials. So that's, that's kind of one of the kernels. We're now seeing cognitive function by way of looking at green, having green surroundings in our workplaces and in our schools and in around our schools, we're seeing improved cognitive performance, better performance on tests, graduation rates, things like that. So um, I, can, I can only scratch the surface of this. People sometimes invite me to talk about this and I can go on for hours. And I've taken now, what, maybe 10 minutes of my allotted time to, to sort of open up and, and help you see this portal uh, to uh, health as, as an opportunity. There is so much of this research that um, where I used to speak about this as study bullet points, you know, Roger Ulrich, hospital healing, uh, Quo and Sullivan, reduced domestic violence in housing, uh, Wolf, uh, retail, improved sales. Now I can actually start to tell stories around subsets of this research. And one of the stories that I set up in some presentations is life course, life cycle, from cradle to grave, we now have studies that demonstrate health benefits. And uh, you, as I look across the room, uh, it looks like we are mostly, you know, here, maybe tending over here. But even at the youngest ages, having nature, contact with nature is quite important. And I'll just, two quick studies. Uh, a colleague of mine with the Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, uh, Jeff Donovan, looked at uh, proximity of trees, proximity of canopy, and then county, local government birth rates, and found a relationship between tree canopy and healthy birth weight. Remarkable 
really. These studies, or this study has now, it's not been replicated, but similar studies have been done now in Madrid, Vancouver, British Columbia, Los Angeles, and there's one other, and I don't recall exactly where it was. But with similar outcomes, nature, birth weights, birth conditions, birth health, um, a little better across a population, not by individual, but across an urban population. Go to the other end of that life spectrum and we see now more and more studies coming about regarding cognitive health for people who are older. Alzheimer's, dementia, other cognitive disorders are becoming ever more uh, prominent in older people. And so within facilities and in and around neighborhoods, there are studies that are exploring the relationship between wander gardens, horticulture therapy, the presence of green, and various outcomes. So in this case, looking at a, a facility where people who have been diagnosed with dementia, our residents, and finding a reduction in the amount of medications that are taken. Also finding fewer falls, and this is so important because when we're older, bones are brittle. When we fall, that is often the gateway to ever more serious injury or serious disease. So this can be quite important for people, again, not on an individual basis, but across a population, across a city, uh, across a nation. Where do you find this information? Where do you find this evidence? Uh, a number of people, my students, colleagues, even biophysical scientists, scientists who are working with biochar, working with biodiversity, have become interested in this. So students and I, uh, with support from the U.S. Forest Service, have created this website, Green Cities Good Health. What we've done is to assemble these articles. In fact, this morning I was at the back of the room and pulled down another 20 of these. The pace of publication is remarkable now. In the, in the 90s, it's, it's like a hockey stick. So it started out, kind of dipped down, and now the pace is it's, it's really um, so many nations, so many people, and we're just tapping English language journals. It, it may be even uh, greater in, in other uh, nations or other, other journals, uh, particularly China. I think there's a lot of activity. So what we've done, we have over 3,000 peer-reviewed articles and a number of technical reports. We've taken those, we've sorted them into a series of topics, about a dozen topics ranging from those topics that pertain to individuals so life cycle and gender, there's a little bit of difference uh, across studies and how women and men, boys and girls respond to nature, uh, work and learning, and then ranging up to a larger scale of community, entire community, local economics, place attachment, that larger sense of connection that, that a neighborhood or a community, a group of people will have to place. So for each of these you will find First an introduction, very quick introduction, the bullet points, if you wish to use those for newsletters or uh, sharing in brief communications with, with uh, uh, decision makers. And then finally below, uh, a longer narrative, a longer um, description of the research continues, all of it fully cited. So if someone should, you might share some of this and they might ask, well, really, you know, what was the study? Are you kidding? Uh, all of the citations are there if you wish to share that or look up the original research yourself. But based on my students' experience, you're not going to read many of the original articles. <laughs> They're snoozers. Some of them are real snoozers uh, or, and, and ever more sophisticated in terms of research method. Uh, some of them are coming out in medical journals and uh, it takes some time to wade through those things and, and read them because of the jargon, because of the language that's being used. So here you are, here is a portal, not my work alone, but a community of science from around the world that are exploring this essential biophilic connection between people and nature and health.